Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we're going to look at a very controversial and tricky little trap for wannabe investors to get caught into, and that is managing their ego and not managing their money. We're going to explore how long-term investing has actually worked in reality rather than the misbelief or beliefs that people often carry. We'll also explore how value investing has changed over the last few years, when just buying cheap companies that have got a growth story is not necessarily the best way for you to make a return on your investment. It's going to be plenty of controversy. It's going to be backed up with hard-nosed, real statistics from the market live today. I know you're going to enjoy the show. See you in the broadcast. Hey there, guys. Welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and of course, my rather splendidly attired offside, Mr. Mitchell Renshaw. Well, Mr. Baxter, very hard not to get an ego about that. And funnily enough, that's the topic of this podcast. The title that we're going to explore here is Protecting Your Money, Not Your Ego. Pretty controversial one. Oh, goodness me. This will be fun. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much going on in the stock market right now. We obviously saw that huge sell down in March. There's a lot of disbelief out there, a misbelief, excuse me, on what long-term investing is. Mm. Now, obviously, there's the inherent level of risk of you know losing money on your stock, but there's a lot more to it. I'd like to go through that with you. Mm. Well, look, I mean, what a great place to start. And yeah, this is a really interesting one. Uh, we've done a bit of research over the last couple of days as a sure team have. on this, and, and, and personally speaking, I'm absolutely flabbergasted with the results that we've come up from. Flabbergasted? Flabbergasted. Wow. It takes a lot for me to be <laughs> flabbergasted. Um, and, and it does, it highlights that there are a lot of lot of beliefs out there that are just simply not right. And look, how this came about, I copped a, look, we've got quite a presence on social media, and I copped a fair bit of hate mail last week for some posts that we put up about moving away from dividend investing into something more reliable. And what it started to prompt me to think about is where are all these people coming from with these comments? And the answer is really simple. People have got a pretty bruised ego right now. You know, if you've been running a share portfolio and you saw, you know, 30, 35 percent of the value get wiped off that, as we saw through the COVID crash, um, you've got egg on your face. And then when you hear us talk about how well our clients are doing, that kind of rubs salt in the wound. And then by no means this broadcast is about being condescending or saying "told you so," but it's prompted me to really examine a little bit of our content and and perhaps. Yeah, really try and tap into those people that currently do have a bruised ego and really strongly encourage them to move it to the side and let us in to help them fix the money side of it because it's a really simple question. It's, do you want to be right or do you want to be rich? Because they are not the same. That's a really powerful statement. And I think with especially what's gone on with, with the whole COVID-19 sell down, mm -hmm. there's a massive misbelief on what's reality mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and what it, what it, what's the beliefs I mean, sure. of long-term investing. Is it really that profitable over the long term? Well, that's, again, possibly a misbelief. And look, one of the comments I always look, I don't know why you idiots, uh, it's always going to get my attention when I see people <laughs> say that, we regard us as being idiots. But you know, what are you idiots bothering trading for? Why don't you just hold on? You know, everything's recovering. You'll be back to break even before you know it. And it's like... That, you know, is, if you had a choice of being at break even or up 35%. I'll take the 35%. Yeah, I'd take 35% profit over break even. But again, it goes back to the person making that comment is, is, is hurt emotionally. And I hate to see investors, they've done the right thing, they've had a go, but their strategy hasn't worked. And part of the reason why they're in pain is because they quite simply have not had risk management in play. Because if you have risk management in play, just like the broadcast we put out to our clients in early March, um, late February, early March, get out of the market, get into cash, unless you're sophisticated enough to be able to trade it short or protect sure. yourself. So we put out a really good early warning, and this isn't a lack of honor, this is just the chronology of what happened. Time to get out. Anyone that hasn't heeded that kind of advice, and typically long-term investors that just hold through these kinds of corrections, has seen the value of their portfolio get decimated. And that's painful. I actually asked the question in one of our training sessions this week, what was the main thing that you took out of what I've just shared with you and every single person on that broadcast said risk management because it's such a critically important thing. So you've got someone that's maybe down 35%. Meanwhile, as their portfolio is getting back to break even, they're getting excited again because after being at a loss, a break even is a win. But is that really any good when you could have made 30, 40% as their clients have been making on the other side? 20 years just to break even, I mean, it's probably not the best mm -hmm. use of your time. I mean, well, take this, the, this market pace though, I mean, it's done right. in five or six weeks. It's been up quickly. But for anyone that's saying, look, I'm back to break even, so that indicates buying and holding for the long term. Let me ask you, Brian, when you sat down and decided to invest in the stock market and you wrote down your goals, because I'm sure you did, was your goal, my goal is to break even as an investor. And it's highly unlikely that was the goal. The goal would have been to make money because that's why most people get into market. Sure. And so, as I said, that bruised ego is very, very painful. And I don't say that to be honorary or beat people up. 
this is not my first rodeo. That's why we've been able to steward our clients through this very, very effectively. Um, and I wish other people would leverage off that and sort of sacrifice their beliefs. But let's look at some of those beliefs going in from there. The, the, the other post that was part of this string, this was Friday night, so I'm having my glass of Shiraz and just had pizza night with the kids. And I'm reading this going, geez, where's this coming from? You know, clearly something has disrupted you. And I guess our message has been quite direct and maybe it has unsettled people, which is good. It should, it should make you- We have to challenge people. So the next question was, why would you bother doing that? Why don't you just own the banks for the next 20 years because you'd be up 400%. And in my mind, I'm thinking, that's actually a pretty sensible thing to say that because you right. know, banks have been you know, the mainstay of our economy. There's probably some truth to that, but it kind of niggled away at me over the weekend. And, and I, I, well, you know, I've got you to crunch the numbers. Let's have a look at what the numbers look like if we were really to explore this and see if it works. And all. You know, again, the old caveat, past performance is no guarantee of future performance. Let's hope that's not the case in this example. <laughs> so I went through and uh, we had a look at the banks as of where they're trading today versus where they were trading in June 2000. What were you doing in 2000, just out of interest? June 2000, I was trading primarily in the NASDAQ, actually. Uh, and, and when I say trading, it doesn't really bear a lot of relevance to what we do today. So I want you to think about this. The cable was pulled out of the back of the phone and plugged into the computer to get dialed up internet. That's what it was, and you had that screaming. That's what trading was then, and I think I had an e-trade account or something at the moment, cracking, and trading the NASDAQ, going quite nicely. Um, I want to ask you what you were doing in 2000. Don't ask me that. Okay, you probably don't remember. I just, there's a couple of memories, a few years there to remember. <laughs> okay, so back in June 2000, a long, long time ago, and if we if we look at the sort of performance of out of the big four, Commonwealth, ANZ, Westpac, and NAB, so, ANZ Bank, to start with that, was at $20.90, and that's exactly where it's trading at today. 20 years later, it's so at break-even. 20 years later, it's at break-even. Okay. Now, you go, okay, well, going back on our previous conversation, break-even is not losing. I'm okay, I broke even, at least I broke even, and I've had some dividends along the way, sure, maybe 4% uh, dividend along the way, but is that adequate compensation for the risk of being in the stock market? Probably, probably not for a 4% return. Okay. Well, what about, just to stop you there, Andrew, what about the cost of living along those times? Well, there you go. So if, if you think about it, and look, let's look at the cost of living on two levels, the official cost of living and the real one that we all live with. Right. According to the RBA, the cost of living in Australia over that 20-year period is up by about 63%. So if you owned ANZ at $20.90, it needed, just to keep up with the cost of living, it needed to be 34 bucks just to keep up with the cost of living, but it's not, it's $20.90. Right. So it's well under. Uh, if you forget about the official cost of living and look at the real one, think about how much property markets have moved. Yeah, 2000, I went down to the Sydney Olympics. I'm in Australia a long way and from the bank actually to go down there and, and, and um, go to the Sydney Olympics. And you, know, you could buy a property in Sydney, you know, in a, in a west, a round week, uh, not round week, I beg your pardon, um, sort of Bell, Main, Leichhardt, that sort of area for probably 700 grand. It's now worth three and a half million. It's crazy. Now, that's not to say property has been a better investment. What we're saying is that long-term hold on ANZ just simply hasn't paid out. Okay. Let's talk about NAB. NAB, if we go back 20 years ago, was trading at $24.50. It's currently around about $23.40. So you're actually down. Not taking out the cost of living, you're actually physically down on your cash. That's over crazy. This is over 20 years. You would not expect this. And this is 20 years where we saw the economy in Australia literally go gangbusters. We've had the golden age of boom. Yet you're behind by doing the right thing holding the big blue chips, the top four banks that can't fail to make money for the long term. Mm. Now, if we look out a bit further afield, West, uh, Westpac, for example, that's actually an okay story. It is about $11.80. It's currently up to the prices of $19.50. Okay. But to, again, kept up with the inflation, it needed to be around about $19. So net-net, taking out cost of living rise, you're about, about square. Okay. So two of them definitely hasn't worked. One is borderline whether you've made anything, sure. but it's certainly not the success. The one surprise and stand out in there is a Commonwealth Bank share price up like a couple hundred percent. So it's trading 50, 59, 60 dollars, somewhere around there now. That's a good example of that. That's the a good example, time. and that was about 26 bucks. So that okay. one has worked. So one in four, one in four buy and hold long term in the great Aussie banks with their 40 franc dividends as only work. Three out of four has failed. You'd be better off playing red or black at least. <laughs> that's not my advice. And look, let's not just down the banks. Two other white yellow chairs. So let's look at AMP or Telstra. Telstra was uh, $6.66 uh, back in June 2000. Got up to nine bucks or something. Got up there to nine bucks at one point. Currently around 326. So you're slaughtered. We won't even go through the numbers. We know it's been a disaster. AMP the same was about $10.20 and that's now $1.82. That's crazy. Total slamming of about, sorry, I think about $6.28 and it's dropped down to about $1.80, $1.85 right now. So that's been slammed as well. And, and, and this is the reality. So here you are, 
you've done the right thing, you've bought and hold, the blue is the blue chips, and you haven't even kept up with inflation, and out of the six examples I've given you, only one has worked. We can talk about brambles, we can talk about salmon, we can go on, because it's actually very broad based, but I pick those because they're the ones that typically be, people buy and hold for dinner. Terrifying story. It, it surprised me, that's why I was, dare I say, flabbergasted. Yeah. Because I really wouldn't have expected that. It doesn't feel like that's been the case, but this is the difference between blindly holding on to something and actively managing it. I'm not talking about day trading it, but at least check up on its performance. And just like my friend that was excited about getting back to break even after such a tumultuous time in the markets, if you've got risk management, you're out. And then you can, if it's not performing, get out of it. And there's your ego. It's, it's your ego is taken out. You know Mitch? You're wrong. That's exactly right. You're wrong. And you have to admit that. You go, look, it didn't work. But rather than have the emotion associated with admitting we're wrong, look, I've been married for seven years now, so as an expression <laughs> I'm used to using, I was wrong. Um, and most of the time I am. My wife, uh, she just has this uncanny ability to be right. She obviously was because she chose to marry me. But Absolutely. That's, that's an aside. Be right and happy two different things, right? <laughs> That's part of that. Um, so in this instance, having that crushing blow to your ego, and look, let's face it, most people that are in the stock market, particularly our client base, I wish there were more women that were traders because they're far better traders than men because they don't let their ego get in the way of the decision. Sure. A lot of guys beating the chest, I can't admit it, just get out. Lose four, five, six percent, get out. And when it starts behaving again, pick it back up. Sure. And you can do that. And that's not day trading, that's just playing those big moves in the marketplace. And I so wish people would just not be resistant to it because if you want to make money, if your goal is not break even or losing money, if it's to make money, you have to be more nimble. Uh, and that ability to be objective and not have emotion in that decision is critical. So that, that's been a huge one over this week. And I know this will be a very controversial broadcast um, because the truth hurts sometimes and the truth will set you free. You've just got to acknowledge it. What you're doing isn't working do you want to roll the dice and hope the next 20 years is going to be a different story? Because just like our wonderful regulators down at ASIC love to say, past performance is no guarantee of future performance, right? Okay. Oh, I love hearing that. And 20 years of dissatisfied return, and the next 20 years will almost certainly be the same if you stick with that strategy. So it's time to do something different. The scary statistics, when you think about it, it's just so different to what the popular belief is. Now, I'm going to challenge you here, Andrew, and I'm going to take the Warren Buffett stance. He's probably the most famous you know, value investor of all time. The whole notion of his investment strategy is to buy and hold for the long term. Yep. How does this differ? Okay. I suppose the caveat on this, because I'll get more hate now, I had some more while, so I you call Warren Buffett an idiot, and that's the last thing I do. Warren Buffett is a genius, he's a hero of mine. I've never had the opportunity to meet him, not yet, but I will, I'm sure. Um, has been a legend, is the most famous investor, one of the most successful investors, and his whole philosophy of buying value has is, is been incredibly successful for his investors. But we get retail clients going, well, I'm following the Warren Buffett approach, it's going to work for me. The challenge is Warren Buffett buys 15% of a company at a time and gets two seats on the board to start challenging. All right. Now, as a consequence, when people see he's on the board and has bought a big chunk, there's a flow of money that goes behind that. So it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're Joe Bag of Donuts and you buy five grand's worth of shares, even if you use that methodology, you're not going to have a board seat. You probably don't have the kudos of people following you into the trade and you're not going to have an impact on the business. So there is a disconnect between what a lot of people think is the approach and the actual approach that it has. And look, I mean, Warren Buffett, how many thousand life lessons can you take out of that? And I, I would just love to sit and not say a word and sit at the table with people like Warren Buffett and Ray Dalio talking about how their trading strategies have worked for decades and just gleaning that great information. But things do change over time as well. And if we, if we, if we take a look at the, 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 the whole approach to value investing versus what the markets are doing right now, let's use a good local example. Let's take Qantas. Sure. Now, Qantas is an Australian icon. Um, and you might like them, you may not, but you can't help it. The flying kangaroo is just something we can be incredibly proud of. Look at the pioneering routes into London <laughs> Direct or into Dallas Direct. Um, yeah, and, and I've always had wonderful experience flying with them. 100 year anniversary this November. It is, it's 100 years. 1920 November. How about that? 100 years time. they've been in business and, 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 and they too have been through these kind of cycles. So, you know, again, it's not their first rodeo. And under Alan Joyce's stewardship, not necessarily a big fan of his remuneration package, but I think under his stewardship, <laughs> um, I think he's done a terrific job in terms of rationalizing unions and, and getting the business sure. But let's take a look at that business run. So last year, 
Qantas, I think, banked, was it about $1.7 billion in profit? Around something? about that. Take 2017 for an example. Okay. That's their second best year in profit of mm. all times, $3.1 billion in profit. Okay, so, so over two years, you've got 1.7 and 3.1 in terms of profit over two years. Yeah, so that's you know, 4.8. So $2.4 billion on average per year profit. Now, if we take Afterpay, now Afterpay made $107 million profit last year, which is a drop in the bucket compared to Qantas. Yet Afterpay, given its market capitalization, is now valued at double what Qantas is worth. It's crazy. It's incredible when you look at that 100-year business that makes billions of dollars of profit, and it's not a one-off, it's done that for many, many years, is an essential service provider that we all know and love and is a trusted and respected brand. And here's a company that's been around for five years and has just scraped over the 100 million profit and is valued at double what that business is. Is that because the whole notion of value investing is different for those companies? I mean, obviously, Qantas, you'd say, is that you could argue that it's a value stock, right? Mm. And that's maybe the Warren Buffett way. Mm. But Afterpay is a very different business. But the returns on Afterpay would have been exceptionally higher than Qantas, for example. But it's pure growth play. And I think as we see dividends continue to get cut, as we've seen with NAV, and we'll see it across the other banks as well, I don't expect to see those dividends get added to as time goes by and we get that swing back to the upside. And it takes enormous pressure off companies to reinvest in themselves and focus on growth rather than paying a dividend out to their shareholders. But more specifically with Afterpay, and this is true of any kind of investment, we buy shares today for what our expectations are of the future. Now, in past podcasts, we've talked about the litmus test um, as to do you see this business having a bigger or smaller part in the future? I think one is going to be around in the future. Let's hope they are. Um, you know, we spend enough time on the plane to really appreciate it. sure do. Um, but you know, I think they're going to be a big part of the future as people start to travel again. But so too is Afterpay. So people are buying that stock for where it can go. And that run it had from sort of $9 to over $50 has been, you know. About a month's time, 500% in, in a month. Incredible run. And so it's, it's created this enormous market capitalization. Take Tesla. Tesla's worth more than General Motors or Ford, yet it sells a tiny fraction of the number of vehicles per year. So valuation of the business, it would seem incredibly overvalued based on its profitability and its sales, just like Afterpay looks incredibly overvalued. But people have dragged into the story that the future growth is going to come from those businesses. And so that then does ask a big question mark over how effective has value investing been. So seeing as we're talking about Warren Buffett, and, and it's the first time we've mentioned him on a podcast, you wouldn't you love to have him in here for a podcast? We should ask him. I'll just call him up after this. Yeah, I think we can give him a call and see what happens. No, just, be, just be just sat here, just, just like in awe of just mesmerized by the, the gems of, Crazy. Uh, of advice and information. Let's have a look at the share price performance of Berkshire Hathaway. Now, Berkshire Hathaway is obviously the holding company and, and, and its shares are trading at a crazy number per share, you know, $100,000 or so per share. It's a big investment. It's a big investment. Um, Berkshire Hathaway share price is up 50% over five years, which is a brilliant return. It's a 10% return per annum, which is you know, above average what we would expect from such a good business. Let's compare that to the NASDAQ. Now, over the same five-year period, the NASDAQ, which is lists typically technology stocks, and not just technology stocks, but mostly, so, you know, your Microsofts and your... Lululemon, Facebook. Uh, Facebook, um, Netflix, all of those companies are on there. The NASDAQ is up 400% over that same five-year period. So 50% return on money has been outstanding over that, you know, 10% a year. But personally speaking, I prefer 400. Me too. I don't like to sound greedy. But if you've got a choice of 50 or 400, what would you go with? Take the free money and you'd have the leak, wouldn't you? And the NASDAQ is so heavily stacked towards that growth story, that futuring uh, of what's going to be here tomorrow. And don't get me wrong, there's been a fair share of doozies in there as well that haven't panned out. But even if you just traded the Qs, the ETF on it, you know, you know, that 400% return is an incredible return. And that's the difference between, I think, just buying and holding a value business and hoping it continues to go up versus being selective in the kind of stocks that you hold and actively trading. When they perform, you buy more of them, and when they stop performing, you get out. There's no ego in it. It's just simply an unimaginable, un 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 object that we buy and sell to help make money. Yet most people are so emotionally invested in their investment decisions because they're emotionally attached to their money. Obviously, they've got to work hard for it. And if only they were able to sever that umbilical cord between their money and their emotions, they'd be so much more objective about what they did and they would make so much more money as a consequence. So to my love letters that I got on Facebook last <laughs> week, 
you know, please understand if you put your ego to the side and recognize the facts. Long-term investing based on the sixth quality, most widely held blue chip shares we have in Australia. We can go through plenty more examples. And look, there are stocks like the miners that have done very well. Sure. Okay, so there are two sides of that story, but these are the big companies that most people hold. If you put your ego to the side and recognize that the strategy that you're painting your colors to has not worked over the last 20 years. What makes you think it's gonna work over the next 20 years? Because they are all value growth-based businesses and we've just looked at what's going on in the future with companies like Afterpay and also then looking at the NASDAQ, that technology loaded type place. And look, I traded the NASDAQ as we started this back in 2000 when we had the boom and the bust. And I know that there are risks that come with that territory, but these are companies that are the future because it's going to be a bigger, bigger part of what we, we see as a world that we live in, whether it's Zoom for a meeting now whether it's paying something on Afterpay, whether it's driving a Tesla, whether it's wearing your Lululemon athletic wear, because they're on the NASDAQ as well. Men and women's range now. Absolutely, men and women's. Or sitting there watching Netflix. And if you're not sure what to do, Google what to do next, because that's on the NASDAQ as well. It's crazy. You've got yourself an indication of really where the future is. Sure. You buy it on eBay, that's it. So, I mean, what we're trying to say, you can even tweak people at the White House as to how good a time you're having with that. <laughs> this, is, this is where we are at. And it's just a crying shame when people wear their heart on their sleeve, they're patriotic, and they buy Australian companies, you know, Qantas, or the banks that we've just talked of, or AMV or Telstra, the bastion of our economy, but they haven't seen the returns as an investor, but it's too unpalatable to go, I was wrong. I should have cut those positions when they stopped working, and maybe, maybe put them into better quality positions that were starting to perform. That's what successful investing is about, and there is a disconnect between managing money and managing your ego, and this isn't, Certainly just to reiterate the criticism of value investing has been very effective. The world's greatest investors make his billions way more than I'll ever make using that strategy. But nonetheless, that discrepancy between where the NASDAQ is right now and where, say, for example, Berkshire Hathaway's performance has been as a consequence of being value-based rather than future-proofing in technology. And they themselves will say, well, we don't have a big exposure to technology. That's not a gig at the moment. Has really shown through for investors and that ability to cut that umbilical cord and be neutral about it and just say is it a good or bad investment now not how it's been over the last 20 years is how you're going to make money in this market wow very very powerful statements there and i think it's so important to know because your ego and your emotion can keep you out of so much money now obviously that's easier said than done andrew so you know just coming to the end of this broadcast what are your final parting words to say okay how do i how do i take out my ego how do I make proper investment decisions that are objective-based? That, that, that is such a massively difficult question to answer because all of us are programmed in a different way. You know, we're in an industry, certainly the industry I started in way back when, um, was an alpha male dominated industry where ego was everything and that's how trading was on a, on a, on a floor, on, on, on an open outcry floor. It was all about ego, who's got the biggest balls, no pun intended, that was, that was how that business was back then. Sure. But how much the world's changed since 1992? You know, we've gone from buying records and vinyl and listening to them to the cassette tape, you probably wouldn't see one of those, into CDs, <laughs> and then the iPod, iPod and now streaming. Yeah, you know, that's all stuff that's happened over that period of time and investing styles have to change. If you were a floor trader now, most ex-floor traders made terrible screen traders because they couldn't get the feel of what was going on. It's a level of playing field now where it's about being smart and having the right strategy and not having your ego invested. I've done a lot of work over the years, and it might be we could maybe pick that up in another another show down the track about working with clients on that trading psychology space because that, for oftentimes, is one of the biggest missing links. You've got the skill set, but if that ego is overdeveloped, you run the risk of going down with the ship, and that's a catastrophe. And and as I've coached several clients through those troubled waters, uh, you know, and I have one client in particular. He was what he described himself as as a sports trader. It was all fun for him, multi decamillionaire. Wow, multi decamillionaire millionaire over in the US, a flyover, spent time with him, uh, and we've got him to get his ego out of his decision making. It went from having fun uh, and just trading for something to do, and I don't say that glibly, the guy had a lot of money and sure. showed something to do, to turning into a profitable business. It's not a hobby, all hobbies cost money, businesses make money, but businesses to succeed need a business plan, and that business plan is objective, it's black and white, and it's written down. And that's why when we work with our clients, we get them to construct a trading plan that's written down. And the job becomes very easy then because all you've got to do is follow that plan rather than following this. Because as soon as you bring this into it, everything just goes south very, very quickly. 
You have to remain objective and taking your emotion out of it is pivotal. And with that comes your ego. Look, Andrew, it's been an absolute pleasure to get your advice here. I think there's some scary statistics in there. There's probably a lot more hate mail coming our way, but we love it. We love challenging popular beliefs and pointing people in the right direction. Ultimately, that's our goal. But on, on that note, you know, yes, you know, we've got thousands of followers, uh, thousands of positive things to say, but it's like anything, sometimes you can focus on the negative. And it really jolted me last week in a positive way because I realized that we're not connecting with those people in a way for them to let us in. And we need to do that. And what I'd ask um, for any of our clients or any of our followers uh, listening to this, that follow us on Facebook, you know, when those comments come through, try and help those people get their head around what actually happens for real. Because this stuff is happening. And when I look at some of our clients, uh, like Guy and Ann Weber, back-to-back -back trade of the month, just had the pleasure of spending a few hours with them on Friday. These are just, and no disrespect to these guys, they're everyday Australians that have done something that they've never done before. They've embraced it, they're disciplined, they've got a process, there's no ego, they're open to learning, and they're averaging two and a half, three percent a week. And that's not for one week, that's been out in for several months and will continue to be because they haven't put an ego in the way, they've just said, we need to manage our money and help me. There you go, the proof's in the pudding. Andrew, thank you very much, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we'll see our viewers on the next broadcast. Always a pleasure, Mitch. Thanks very much. Well, that's one that's going to garner plenty of controversy. Make sure you give us some comments, a review and feedback, as well as a rating, and we'll see you next week.